All right, thank you very much for the music ministry. Now uh, let's turn in our Bibles. Let's go to Psalm chapter 104, continuing our doxology. And uh, we're going to do the second half of Psalm uh, 104 this morning as we uh, did the first half on uh, Thursday night in uh, quite a long psalm, so I broke it up into two sections. But this is a great praise and psalm of our Lord in regard to Him being the creator of the heavens and the earth, again, praising His majesty and His sovereignty in His creative acts. So in Psalm 104, we're going to uh, read verses 18 through 35. It says, The high mountains are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the sephanim, which is basically a rock badger, as we would call today. In verse 19, He made the moon for the seasons. The sun knows the place of its setting. You appoint darkness, and it becomes night, in which all the beasts of the forest prowl about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. Man goes forth to his work and to his labor until evening. O Lord, how many are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals both small and great. There the ships move along in Leviathan, which you have formed to sport in it. They all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give to them, they gather it up. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Let the glory of the Lord endure forever. Let the Lord be glad in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Let my meditation be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall be glad in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. So again, a great uh, psalm of praise to our Lord for his great creative acts. All right, now let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And in Ephesians chapter 6, we continue to understand now the last section of uh, the book of Ephesians, again in also chapter 6. And we are now being told how to stand strong in the Lord as we stand in warfare. And that's what we've been noting in these last couple of sessions. We'll continue to note as we go through the end of this chapter all the way down to verse 24. And as I've uh, reminded you, remember the book of Ephesians to this point has told us how to walk in Christ. Now we are told to stand firm in Christ. And again, we're going to see picking up and putting on the full armor of God. And so as we see the outline for Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 24, we're talking about the empowerment, which we already did in verse 10. Then in verses 11 through 12, which we are beginning this morning, we're talking about the enemy, although the empowerment still is part of verse 11. Then we're going to talk about the equipment, the armor of God, the energy that we have in verses 18 through 20. And then finally, the encouragement to continue to go forward in the plan of God in verses 21 through 24. So as we begin verse 11 and 12 this, e uh, this morning, we are talking about now the enemy. But that is really what we're going to pick up on on Tuesday night of this week, because the first half of verse 11 continues the theme of being strong in the Lord. And then at the second half of this verse, it identifies the enemy inside this warfare, inside the battle of the angelic conflict that we all are a part of. So let's read the scriptures and then we'll get into some of the details this evening or this morning now in verse 10 it says finally but again as i showed you the greek already really it says for the rest of the time or from now on be strong in the lord and there we have the word uh, a cognate of dunamis again that strength of god that inherent strength of god and then it says in the strength of of his might. Again, the dominion, the wielding of that power, and then also the inner ability that is given to us. So finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now in verse 11, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of 
the devil. And so that's what we are now noting in verse 11. Again, putting on the full armor of God so that we can stand firm as we are part of this angelic conflict as identified by the schemes of the devil. So therefore, as we now look into this verse, we're going to be talking about the enemy. And this is great imagery that has been given to us as we continue on in this chapter and look at the various pieces of armament that are mentioned here that reminds us of what Isaiah also said during the Old Testament time frame in Isaiah 59 17 chapter 11 verses 4 and 5 and also in chapter 52 in verse 7 where we have the imagery of various parts of armor that we are to put on and in fact as I show you now Isaiah chapter 59 in verse 17 it really was pre uh, 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 predestining the Lord Jesus Christ coming putting on the armor of God himself during his humanity and then ultimately winning the victory at the cross. So it says he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. And therefore, Jesus Christ, who is the prototype of the spiritual life that we are to live during this church age in which we are all living in now, Jesus Christ had to do the same thing that we are also commanded to do in Ephesians chapter 6. Pick up and put on the full armor of God. And I'm going to explain uh, some of the nuances and details that we see within scriptures in regard to picking up and putting on that armor of God. And then when we get into verses uh, 12 and beyond, we're going to talk about the various aspects of the armor, the, the uh, helmet, the shield, the sword, the breastplate, you know, the, the shoes that we are to wear and what those things mean. We'll get into that in due time. But right now we're just talking in overview of that armor of God that we are to put on. And it's interesting, as I said on Thursday night, and if you haven't seen that lesson as of yet, uh, go online and uh, uh, look at that and review it, because I had some fascinating things, which are also uh, given to you in the Word that we put out every week, which is a summation of the teachings uh, in the prior week. But as you look at uh, that Word that you should have before you somewhere on the table uh, there, and if you go to, let me just get to it myself, I think it's page in the back half, like uh, pages 7 and 8, uh, Paul was writing this letter in regard to the ancient pagan gods that were around the uh, early church at that time. And specifically in Ephesus, they had one pagan god that they venerated above all others, and that was the Greek goddess Artemis. Again, the goddess of war and the hunt and virginity and fertility and provision and all these things. And you can see the statue of imagery that they would have for this individual, uh, again, Artemis, back in in the uh, day of Ephesus in the writing of this uh, this uh, uh, book and these passages. And basically it was a woman, again, orda uh, ordained in all kinds of things, but then you look at the breast of this woman and there are like all kinds of breasts protruding from her, which means she's got enough for everybody. She has enough provision for all individuals. And again, that's what the many-breasted type of idolatry that uh, worship that they had back in the day is that there was plenty for everybody and lots of sustenance for all. And then you see other images that are uh, uh, drawings in regard to the uh, temple and the worship of her and the sacrifices that they would do. But even though we may not have a Greek goddess or a Roman goddess, which her name was also Diana in the Roman Empire, as they changed it from Artemis to Diana, even though we may not have those pagan worships in our day and age, in our periphery, although they are still out there in the world, we do have other imagery that we are bombarded with and other things that we are tempted to worship day in and day out as we are bombarded by our media, the movie, the TV, uh, the magazines, the radio. And I also gave you a picture of that where one of the heroines of our recent movies, uh, The Hunger Games, and also Wonder Woman, whose name is Diana, actually, literally, uh, within the cartoon character, ultimately giving the imagery of that Artemis woman, the great huntress, the great leader that we to venerate and look up to. So again, one of the many things that we are bombarded with each and every day may not be a false religion that we are, again, up against, but it's the imagery and the messages that are coming from the media bombarding the mentality of your soul each and every day. 
And when we are given this doctrine and these passages to put on the armor of God, it's not talking about protecting your physical body as the Roman soldier or the Greek soldier would have armament to to protect the physical body, but it's all about protecting the mentality of your soul. And that's truly where the battle is. That's where the warfare is. That's what we need protection from each and every day. Because if we're not protecting our soul each and every day, we're going to be influenced by what? Satan and sin, our flesh, every day. And it's interesting, as I've been going through this uh, doctrine and uh, these teachings over the past uh, couple of days, I've been thinking about the word deception and being deceived. And what's interesting about somebody who tries to deceive another is that they're trying to influence that individual without the individual even knowing it. You see, that's what deception is. It's not that you get something smack in the face and you know it's absolutely wrong and therefore you're not going to do it. No, deception is to subtly influence you without you even knowing that you are being influenced. And again, if we don't put on the armor of God to protect the soul, the heart of our soul, the mentality of our soul, the right lobe and the left lobe, as we like to call it, the noose, the cardia, as the Greek calls it, if we're not putting on the armor of God to protect that soul, then what's going to happen? We will be influenced, we will be deceived, and we won't even know it. We won't even know it. And yet we think that we will be doing right and operating in righteousness each and every day, but ultimately we'll be walking off in a negative direction. So that's why, again, we are commanded in this passage to put on, and again, put on the armor of God so that you are protected in the mentality of your soul from within the flesh, the old sin nature, the sins that tempt you from outside, Satan's world and his cosmic system so that you are protected from those things all in the mentality of your soul. And again, yes, some physical things can happen when you enter into sin. We know that from Scripture, that if you have enough sin in your life, there's going to be physical ailment that goes along with that. But ultimately, it all starts with the mentality of your soul that we ought to be protected from. And we have an interesting Greek word that I could actually put a whole doctrine together, but I'm just going to give you the overview of what this really means to us in this passage and in our spiritual walk. But we have that word in duo. And then again, it's in the aorist tense, and I give you that in the Greek, the constative aorist tense, which looks at, looks at it at, as an overview, kind of like a, a movie or a broad brush picture or painting that you can review and look at. The aorist tense is looking at the entirety of the action. Again, the entirety of the action of you putting on this armor that God has for you. The middle voice is interesting, and I found it interesting as I looked at the verbs starting in verse 10, now into verse 11, and then going down into the rest of these passages. It all started back in verse 10 with the passive voice. Be strong in the Lord. In other words, you receive the action of being strong. You receive the power of God by taking in His Word, being filled with God the Holy Spirit. You receive that from God because it's His power that you are putting on. Well, then there's now a subtle change here where we have in this phrase or this word put on. It's now in the middle voice where it's changing subtly, not just from receiving the action, but something that now you have to participate in. But when you do participate, there's a benefit back to you. And then it gets even more interesting as we get down, uh, you know, into the uh, subsequent passages and especially in uh, 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 verse uh, 13, where it says, therefore, take up the full armor of God. And then even uh, going back uh, before that, when it talks about standing firm a little bit later on, when it talks about that in the latter passages, it goes from the passive to the middle, now to the active voice. So I love how God utilized the Greek language and the word uh, the verbs here to take us from the receiving of the power of God, having to be part and parcel in that, having some responsibility of our own to put on this armor and being benefited by it so that when the temptations of the world come, we stand firm in the active voice. Because remember, God cannot stand firm for you. He can give you the power, he can give you the strength, but you have to make the decisions. 
And so we go from that passive to the middle, now all the way down to the active voice where we have to perform the action. That's our responsibility. That's our accountability. Now, this word in duo, let me give you a little bit about that and show you some of the nuances there that are fascinating as well. But it basically, it does mean to dress yourself, to clothe yourself, or to put on, as we have here. Put it on, and again, we know it's going to be the armor of God. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But when we go back to Scripture and we look at the Old Testament, <coughs> And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this same word in duo is used in two fascinating uh, passages. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 18, it says, Then the Spirit did what? Came upon. And that's our word in duo. Clothed him. Put on himself into that uh, person. Amasi, who was the chief of the 30, one of David's uh, leading army, uh, 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 army men and uh, generals of his court. But basically, then the spirit came upon. Again, in duo is the word there. Then we also see it in Second Chronicles 24.20. Then the spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest okay so what, what again we do we see the spirit of god came upon now i show you these things because you should know and i think most of you do know that in the old testament they didn't have at the moment of their salvation the permanent indwelling of god the holy spirit nor did they have the opportunity for the filling of the holy spirit universally as we do now in the church you see during the old testament only selectively and a few times would the Holy Spirit come upon somebody to indwell them, as it were, and fill them to empower them to do some great act or task for God. And again, all the writers of the Old Testament had this empowerment. Many men that we read about as these two individuals in Chronicles had the empowerment of God come upon them. And the word in duo is used to signify that. And that's why you might have heard me talk about in the past, you know, in the New Testament, we have the permanent indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, for all believers. Again, it's a universal indwelling from the moment of our salvation that stays with us throughout our entire spiritual life here on planet Earth. And then we have the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit when we walk in righteousness. And if we walk in sin, confess your sin, be cleansed, and now you're filled with the Spirit once again, comparing 1 John 1, 9 with Ephesians 5.18. You see, in the church age, we have the universal ability to have the empowerment of God, the Holy Spirit. And oh, by the way, it's again your choice. Your choice to be filled with Him or not to be filled with Him. To sin and not be filled or to confess sin and walk in righteousness being filled. In the Old Testament, they didn't have that opportunity. He would come and go based on God's plan and desire uh, for an individual's lives. And so therefore, from the word in duo, we call that in theology the endowment of the Spirit to differentiate it from the Old Testament now into the New Testament. But the important fact that I wanted to show you here is that the endowment or the enduo has to do with what? The indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. So we see that from these Old Testament uh, principles. The temporary endowment of the Holy Spirit compared to the permanent indwelling of God the Holy Spirit that Romans chapter 8 verse 11 tells us about now in the church age. And then again comparing Ephesians 5.18 with 1 John 1.9 we have the filling of God the Holy Spirit that's available to all believers. Not just a few and not just a select few based on God's sovereign choice and plan but his sovereign choice and plan is for all believers of the church age to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's again why we live in a unique time. We live in fascinating times. We live in exciting times because we have power available to us like never before. The Old Testament saints would die to have the power that you and I have. They would die to have the opportunity to have what you and I have on a consistent basis. But unfortunately for the church, because it's so universal and common, you know what happens to things that are common. They get forget about. They get put aside. It's oh, no big deal. Everybody's got it. It's nothing. 
And again, even in our society, it's only the unique, only the special, only the different. Wow, that's so cool. But what's so cool for us is that we have this ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit from the moment of our salvation. That is the power that's available to us. That's the empowerment that God gives to us. That's what goes back into be strong in the strength of His might. It's all about the Holy Spirit working within your soul. Interesting enough, in the New Testament, in duo is also used for the clothing of Jesus Christ. And we have it in two passages. First in Galatians chapter 3.27, it says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And this baptism with the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, the one true baptism, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at the moment of your salvation. But what's also interesting in Romans 13, 14, not just talking about the permanent indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, but now the taking on and the application of the power of God the Holy Spirit. And in this case, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 13, verse 14, but put on what? The Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So isn't it interesting that we clothed ourselves at the moment of our salvation with Jesus Christ, talking about His permanent indwelling of us. And as you know, one of the unique factors of the church age is the permanent indwelling of all three members of the Trinity inside of us. So we have the Holy Spirit, we have Jesus Christ, and God the Father. But even though there's an indwelling, it doesn't mean that we are tapping into that resource all the time. And that's why we have uh, commands like this in Romans 13, 14, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though He's inside of you and He has indwelt you from the moment of your salvation, you still need to utilize that power and strength through your volitional responsibility. You have to make the decision. You have to make the choice. Put Him on. Just as we see in our passage, put on the full armor of God. And as it said in verse 10, which is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. His inherent power, His inner ability to function and operate, and also that wielding power that is manifested, again, when we apply Bible doctrine within our lives. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, this word in duo is fascinating as it's used throughout the New Testament. It's not used a lot, but it's also used in, uh, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, but in Romans chapter 15, talking about having the what? Resurrection body. When this mortal must put on immortality. When this flesh is thrown off and we gain our resurrection body. And the word in duo is actually used for that as well. Put on the resurrection body. So we see this word in duo in several fascinating passages, including ours, talking about putting on the Holy Spirit, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, putting on the full armor of God, and then also we'll be putting on one day in total perfection and joy, peace, and happiness when the angelic conflict is finally over, putting on our resurrection body. Actually, we're going to put it on before then, but it will be like it's already over at that point. Again, just the millennial reign to be played out after the tribulation. But in any case, put it on. And so we ought to put this thing on. And that thing that we ought to put on is that full armor of God, combining the power of God, the Holy Spirit that is indwelling you, the power of Jesus Christ that is indwelling you. Now you need to really put that on, which we also know is the Word of God, the mind of Jesus Christ that we have to take in on a consistent basis. And when we do, we have the dunamis, the kratos, and the iskos of God operating within our soul. And we have power for victory. We have power to overcome. And as you know, the strategic victory has been won by Jesus Christ at the cross, but we still are fighting the battle. It's like the mop-up operation, we can call that, after the victory has been won. The tactical victories that we are fighting each and every day over our souls. 
Again, our soul belongs to God, but many times we can give it to Satan, to sin and the world. We can give it to the enemy if we let them lead us astray, if we let them deceive us and trick us into thinking that we're doing okay when in a, a total re a reality we are not. So again, we are commanded, put on the full armor of God. And when you have that armor of God, you see the craftiness of Satan. You see the schemes of the devil. You see the trickery of the world and its, it, its influence and the messages that are coming at us and bombarding us each and every day. You see the, the, the craftiness of that to lead you away from your walk and relationship with God. But it's only when you have that armor of God can you have that 2020 vision of what sin and Satan and the world are doing to you and to your soul. And with that armor, you see it like never before, and you know how to defend against it. You know how to offensively beat it so it doesn't defeat you. You know how to overcome it. So again, God wants us to walk in this way. He gives us all the opportunity and ability. He's provided us all the power so that we can be imitators of Him, as we've seen in chapters 4, chapter 5. Be imitators of Christ. Be imitators of God. And the way we are imitators of God is by putting on this armament that he has waiting for you. And as we said, we also saw it in the book of Isaiah, the armament that was for them. You know, even though they didn't have the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, they had the word of God. And they had the word of God that would give them power, give them strength. They had knowledge of their salvation that would give them hope, give them confidence, giving them that security of eternity, giving them strength and power, giving them what? Faith. So we too have the same armament that was available to them, but even more so, even emphasize more with the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit inside of you. Let's turn our Bibles. I want you to go to, uh, uh, let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Well, actually, before that, go to Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians 4.24. Let's look at that real quick just to remind ourselves. <coughs> and in Ephesians 4.24... <coughs> Let's go back to verse 20. It says, But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. That, in reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self. Again, the old man, the old sin nature, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And that you be what? Renewed in the spirit of your mind. Remember, as it says in verse 24, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you or his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And then it goes on to talk more about mental and overt sins that we can enter into. But back in verse 24, we are to what? In duo, the new self. Again, the new spiritual species that you are, the new creation that you have been made. Again, regenerated at the moment of your salvation, given the new human spirit inside of you, which was dead prior to your salvation. You are now alive in Christ with a perfect nature, with absolute holiness and righteousness inside of you. And also with the indwelling of the Trinity. Put on the new self. Synonymous terms with putting on the armor of God. Taking that new spiritual being that you are that can understand, uh, learn, and apply spiritual phenomenon, the Word of God, Bible doctrine. Put that on so that you have the armor of God and are protected in the problems and the difficulties and the temptations of life, the lusts of the world. Let's go now to Colossians chapter 3 and verses 10 through 14. <clears throat> and there again we have our word in duo. <clears throat> in 
verse 12, let's get context. It says, And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, and again, that's who you are. You stand in perfect righteousness. You are a loved one of God. You are the family of God. You are chosen by God. Holy, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You see, this is the result of having the armor of God in your soul, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, what? Put on love. And again, because we've been told to put on other things. Well, actually, let's go back to verse 10. Let's go to verse 9. It says, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have what? Put on the new self who is being renewed to the, a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, a barbarian Scyth uh, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. That's our equal privilege and our equal opportunity. Now jumping down to verse 4, that put on continues, and beyond all these, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So again, we ought to clothe ourselves with all these things. We clothe ourselves with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We clothe ourselves with the utilization of the mind of Jesus Christ resident within our soul called the Word of God. We clothe ourselves with the application of that Word in patience, kindness, and in love. Again, we put these things on. You see, the world wants you to put those things off. The world wants you to be undressed. The world wants you to be naked. Isn't that what we typically see in the movies and TVs these days? A bunch of naked bodies running around? Yes, we do. That's a picture of our souls. If we go the way of the world. We're naked. We have no defense. And again, as they used to like to say, the emperor has no clothing, right? Back in the day, doesn't know what he's doing, doesn't know what he's talking about. He's got no power. He's got no strength. He's just a puppet figurehead. Again, don't be a puppet figurehead of the Christian life. Be a member of the royal family of God, a royal priest, a royal ambassador. In fact, in duo is used in other scriptures and passages for putting on royalty. And they would talk about the emperor or the king putting on his royal garments. So in duo is another aspect of putting on the royalty that you are, as 1 Peter chapter 2, verses uh, 5 and 9 specifically talks about. So what are we to put on? Again, the full armor of God. And uh, uh, the Greek word that we have here for full armor of God is panoplia, panoplia. And panoplia does mean, again, it comes from uh, the, the uh, root word there is hop, hoplon, and a couple of uh, root words around that, that does mean armor or instruments or weapons. But when it has the word pan in front of it, it comes from the Greek uh, prefix pas, which means all or every, pan, again, as you know, is the whole megillah, as we sometimes like to say, okay, the whole thing. Put on the full armor of God is what this word comes to mean. And it means heavily armed infantry. Again, heavily armed uh, soldiers on the battlefield. And in that you have both offensive and defensive weapons. And what we're going to read, as you know, in the rest of the book of Ephesians is in regard to the first defensive armament that God has given to us, but also talking about the offensive weapon. Again, the sword of the Spirit the Word of God, the power that we have, both defense to withstand so that we can see the deceptions that are coming at us, have 2020 vision, have doctrine to understand what it is and what it is designed to do, and then turn it back around and defeat it and say, no, you're not going to do it because the Word of God says. Remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness uh, from Satan three times, he first had to put on the defensive weapons to withstand the attack of the temptation that the tempter was giving and to see it from a 2020 vision, to see the deception, to see through the malaise and the fog. And then he did what? He defeated it with the Word of God. 
Because he said, the Word of God says, the Word of God says, the Word of God says. And you and I, uh, to do the same thing. The full armor of God is exactly the same. Have the armor of God defensively to stand firm and stand your ground. In other words, keep the doctrine in your soul. Keep the spiritual adulthood that you have achieved in your spiritual walk. Keep in that position. Don't go backwards. Don't lose ground. Keep it, and then when you see those temptations come, you can def uh, defeat it with the offensive weapons of the Word of God. And then, as a result of that, you're going to grow more. And now you've got a new place to stand, and a new place to stand, and a new place to stand. You see, standing firm just doesn't mean treading water. This is as far as I'm going to go. I'm not going to go any further. I, I like my little, you know, spiritual life. Uh-uh. Standing firm means hold the ground that you've already obtained, already captured, and then defeat whatever comes your way so that you can take another step forward. You see, when the enemy rushes at you, again, they were all designed to hold their ground. And when they did, they would thrust their swords or thrust their spears and wipe out that line and then do what? Take a step forward. And then hold the ground again. Thrust the sword. Take a step forward. You see, that's our spiritual life. That's what we need to do. Not tread water and say, I'm okay here. Keep going forward. And if you don't stand your ground, again, as you know what that is, it's all about retreat. So again, we see this word being used throughout Scripture. We have it again in verse uh, uh, 13. Let's go back to um, Ephesians <coughs> in uh, chapter 6 once again. Because again, we're going to see in verse 13, Therefore take up the full armor of God, that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Again, ask yourself this. Have you done everything to stand firm? Again, we'll talk about that later on. But we have this here in verse 13. But also I'm going to show you a little bit in just a few minutes in Luke chapter 11, verse 22, where our word panoplia is used once again, but in a very interesting way. But let me give you some other passages that talk about this full armor of God. The totality of the weaponry, defensive and offensive weapons and armament that God gives to us to wield in our daily walk. In 1 Peter 4, 1, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Again, undeserved suffering, suffering for blessing, however we, you like to call that. As Christ suffered, didn't look like a victory at the cross, did it? No, it looked like a lot of defeat there at the cross. And I'm sure Satan and all his little minions were dancing around their little, you know, maypoles or whatever they used to dance around, you know, happy and like, yay, 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 we won. But no, in what looked like defeat to the world was actually victory in the angelic conflict. And so as Jesus Christ suffered and won that victory, you too, and sometimes from suffering and going through that. If you stand firm, it's going to be victory within your life. In Romans 6.13, And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments. Again, panoplia, as instruments of unrighteousness. Because that's how we could operate. We could be fighting for the wrong side sometimes. And using the weapons of the world and sin and Satan. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Again, that new nature, the new spiritual creature that you are. And your members as instruments of what? Righteousness. Let's walk in righteousness each and every day. Now in Romans 13, 12, it also says, The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of the darkness, sin, and put on what? The armor of light. And again, going back to Jesus Christ, His Word, etc., etc. Let's now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And, another, uh, you know, and also in uh, uh, chapter 10, which we'll see in just a minute. But again, two other passages that use panoplia as the Greek word that we translate the full armor of God. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 6... <coughs> 
I'm going to read uh, from verses uh, 1 all the way down to verse 10 here. <coughs> In verse, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says at the acceptable time, listen, oh, or excuse me, at the acceptable time, I listened to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation giving no cause for offense in anything in order that the ministry be not discredited. But in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in affliction, in hardship, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. And again, right hand and left hand, and one hand's a shield and the other hand's a sword. Defense, offense, that's right hand, left hand. By glory in dishonor, by evil report in good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold. And again, the, uh, Paul was stoned to death at one point, but yet God resuscitated him. We live as punished, yet not put to death, as sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. So again, that weapons of righteousness, again, the full armor of God being resonant within our soul. Let's now go to chapter 10, and let's look at verses 3 and 5. <clears throat> All right, Second Corinthians 10, verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, again, we have a sin nature, it's out there, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful. So let me just uh, correct that a little bit, because it's li literally this time flesh is talking about the human body. And we're not dealing in the human realm here is what's in view. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of what? Fortresses. And again, fortresses. And not just the armament that you have, but fortresses. Verse 5. It says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And again, uh, you can read the rest of that on your own. But here we have, again, the weaponry, the armament that God has given to us so that we can destroy, again, the fortresses of sin and Satan that are inside this cosmic system. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Let me give you Ephesians chapter 5, uh, uh, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. Panoply is not used here, but we see the armament once again. It says, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Again, having faith and trust and hope, confident expectation in God, love towards God and your fellow neighbor, and then what? That hope of salvation. Knowing that you have eternal security and this world can do nothing to you because you're going to live forever and ever and ever. Again, the armament that God gives to us. So the implements of war that have been given to us are mighty. Why? Because they've been supplied by God. And they are of God. His kratos, his dunamis, his iscus. We have the power of God available to us and within us, ready to be wheeled at any point in time. And with them, as Paul did, we can pull down, we can overpower, we can conquer, and we can destroy the demonic spiritual strongholds that are in this world. And maybe even in your life. We can overcome those things. Because why? We have greater power in us than that is in the world or Satan. 
And since the gods of this world, as we see in Satan's cosmic system and the things that we are you know, bombarded with to worship each and every day, and again, we don't have a temple of Artemis that we go to and bow down and worship and sacrifice to, but there are temples that are raised up in the imagery and the mentality of your soul of things that you are giving yourself over to and bowing down and worshiping those things to the exclusion of God. And since the gods of this world are standing at the gates, holding those bars in so that whoever is imprisoned by them, the unbeliever and sometimes believers, they're holding on and making sure they don't get loose. But yet you and I have been given the spiritual armament so that we can be successful in this warfare. We have the spiritual weapons so that ultimately we can set the captives free. And sometimes that captive is you yourself in the mentality of your own soul and the things that are holding you back in the spiritual life. The addictions that you may have, the, the lusts that you may have, the things that are holding you back from going forward. You have the power to overcome them. You have the power to withstand them. You have the power to see them coming, even in the fog and malaise of deception that they may be throwing at you. You have the power to overcome them. And as the point goes, as I have up on the board, again, we first need this armament for ourselves. First, use it for yourself. And unfortunately, too many Christians in the world, and hopefully uh, not in this room or hearing my voice today, but maybe there are some, that whenever you hear doctrine, you're thinking about, oh, it's them, it's over there, it's this, it's that. You're pointing to everybody else. No, this armament is for you. You need this armament first and foremost. You need this power to see the deceptions that are coming after you, to stand firm against them and then defeat them so you can take a step forward. You first need it for yourself. And don't be looking at other people and other things and saying, oh, it's them, it's them, and they need this, and they need that, and da 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 blah, blah, blah. It's you. It's me. It's all of us. And first, it's meant for us. But once we pick it up and put it on, now we can use it for our fellow neighbors. Now we can use that power to point out the deceptions of life, to point out the deceptions of the world, to point out the, the, the falsehoods that are coming in regard to what is salvation, what is life, what is eternal life, what, you know, uh, what is God or what is not God. The evolutionary theories, whatever the case may be, now we have the power to point that out to our fellow mankind to free those who are held captive by them the gods of this world. But if we don't wield it for ourselves first, we ain't going to wield it for anybody else. Okay? It's got to be used for us first. And then you can wield it to free the captives. And then as we kind of wrap it up for this morning, and I want to show you one other passage before we get done and just give you that little interesting aspect. But again, we can't part, you know, th this doesn't command us to put on just a piece of the armament. You can't just take a shield and leave your head exposed. You'll be dead. You can't have a helmet and leave your chest exposed. You'll be dead. Try to be so literal. You've got to put on the full armor of God. And so therefore, we can't take partial armament from the Word of God and then say, well, I'm going to combine that with the world. What the world says is strong and power and might. And I'll use, blend these two things and I'll create my own religion. <laughs> or whatever the case. Or my own path and walk my own way. No, we've got to take the full armor of God, period. And we can't just take partial armor of God. One piece or two piece. We've got to put the full armor of God on. And again, utilize that each and every day. Knowing what these things are, how to apply them, how to wield them, that's what we're going to learn. That's what we're going to do as we go forward having the full armor of God. Because again, no opening at the head, at the feet, the heart, the belly, the eye, the ear, or the tongue should be laid open for Satan to take advantage of. And oh, by the way, if there is a place in your life that is laid open and bare, he's going to take advantage of it. 
And you may not think he's going to, but that's part of the deception. He's going to take advantage of it. And so I'll leave you with these passages. In Luke chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 22. Okay. In Luke chapter 11, verse 22, it says, But when someone stronger, this is Jesus speaking, and the literal context is talking about an unbeliever who was demon-possessed and then the demons left, okay? But then later on, because there was no salvation in this person's life, even after they were freed, okay, of the demons, and they didn't believe Jesus and have salvation, those demons can come right back in. All right, so it says, but when someone stronger, talking about Satan, cosmic system, than he, again, the man himself, Again, are you stronger than Satan or any one of his demons? Absolutely not. We have no power of ourselves. They are stronger than us. That's why we need the power of God. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he, Satan, takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes the plunder. Now again, we're talking primarily about the unbeliever here and about the loss of the armament. But again, it's not the armament that the believer would have, okay? But he's basically saying everything that that unbeliever relied upon, it's all going to be gone. He's going to take it away. And so the application for us as believers is, yes, you're not going to lose many of these armaments that we have before us because we stand positionally in them. But what we will lose is the utilization of them the application of them in faith and hope and trust and in confidence and again satan can steal your armor not that you're going to lose your salvation or take any of those things away but there are aspects of the application of those that you can lose and satan steals that and he don't want to give it back <laughs> but you can always take it back that's the great thing about grace and the plan of god can always take it back and put that armor up once again. And as it says, we know talking about unbelievers here in uh, verse 23, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And again, which side do you want to be on? Do you want to be the side of Satan and his cosmic system and play in that world, or do you want to be part of the family of God that you have been made? be part of that family you need to pick up and put on the armor of god for yourself first and then wield it for other people so that they are freed just as you have already been freed from sin and satan and his cosmic system and remember this armament is what of god it's not of man it's not of any good works or morality that you can conjure up in your life because a lot of good people are out there that do good things but this is a spiritual warfare, and therefore we need spiritual weaponry and armament. And therefore we need the armor of God. And I'll talk on Tuesday as we get into the enemy. It's interesting that the language that Paul uses here is very mythological. Playing off of what the ancient pagan religions were all about. Oh, this God's going to give me this power, and that God's going to give me a baby, and that God's going to feed me, and this God's going to give me this, and this God's going to give me that. And Paul is playing off of that to reprove and rebuke and repudiate those ancient pagan religions, as it should be for us today, of what the world is offering you and can provide for you and do for you, to refudiate all of that, but yet in the reality of the spiritual realm. You see, those gods couldn't do any of those things. It was all made up. There's no power in those gods. But in the reality of the spiritual life, there is power in Jesus Christ. And we need to pick it up and put it on so that we have the full armor of God in our soul, being victorious then as we walk inside the spiritual life. All right, so let's close now in, uh, in prayer. In, uh, uh, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for the power and strength that comes from you and your word and your son and your spirit and your great plan for our lives. Father, we just can't thank you enough for all that you have done for us. And Father, we just ask that you lead us to understand how to put this armor on more and more each and every day. Thicken the shield, sharpen the sword, lengthen the sword so that we can be victorious in all that we do. Father, we ask that you give us victory in our daily walk each and every day as we put these things on and wield them all to your glory. So, Father, we ask that you be with us as we uh, close our service this, e this morning. In Christ's precious name, 
Amen. <clears throat>